Good morning. Let's stand together. Aren't you glad that the Lord's work isn't yet finished? He's still moving. He's still acting. He has something he wants to accomplish this morning. I just know it.
Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Brad. I'm one of the pastors here, and we just want to take this time just to welcome you uh, and say thank you for worshiping with us this morning, whether you're here with us in the building or if you're worshiping with us online. If you're with us online, Carly is hosting you guys today all the way from St. Louis, so go ahead and hit her with a Let's Go cards in the chat. That would be appreciated. Not many Cardinals fans here, so that one. But, uh, but yeah, make sure to interact uh, with her in the chat. And we also just want to take this time uh, just to remind you or maybe let you know for the first time about what we call our central hub. So if you're here with us uh, in the building, uh, there's a QR code on the screen behind me as well as on the posts if you're on the sides of the worship center that if you get your phone out, open your camera app and point it at that, uh, it'll take, a link will pop down you can click on. That'll take you to our central hub. If you're with us online, there'll just be a link provided in that chat you can click directly on. Uh, and that'll take you to our central hub, which is just kind of all things connecting point. Um, if you want to join or see our prayer wall or submit a prayer request to be on the prayer wall, that's there. If you need to get in contact with the church office or a pastor, there's a tab for that. Uh, but also, if this is your first time with us, there's a tab that just says, I'm new. Uh, and then if you would just fill out a few simple questions uh, on a form, that'll pop up. That just helps us kind of know who's here with us, helps us with our tracking. Uh, and if you do that for me, uh, I would love if after service you meet me at our next steps table, which is right in front of our You Belong Here wall out in the lobby. And we have a couple different gifts we'd love for you to choose from and get in your hand just to tell you thank you for worshiping with us and we appreciate you being here with us. Uh, and also just a reminder for our women, today is the last day to register uh, for the women's retreat, which can also be found um, on that central hub, I believe, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, and if you need to register, we'll have iPads at the Next Steps table uh, out there set up after service that you can come register if you haven't registered yet and want to join our women on that retreat. And now here's a few more announcements. The next opportunity for baptism will be Sunday, August 28th. Baptism is all about going public with your faith, a step we take to tell the world that we follow Jesus. It serves as an outward symbol of a commitment made in our hearts. If you're interested in taking this next step or would like more information, let us know by filling out the form on the Seapoint Central Hub under Baptism and Membership. Our August featured community partner is the Friendship Home, a nonprofit that helps survivors of domestic violence and their children find physical and emotional safety. Throughout the month of August, we will be collecting diapers in sizes five and six, baby all-in-one body wash, baby lotion, hypoallergenic laundry detergent, and household cleaning supplies. Please place your donations in the bin located by the office door. If you prefer for us to do the shopping for you, you can give financially online please mark your donation, Featured Community Partner. Calling all golfers. Connecting Point Youth will be hosting a golf tournament on September 25th at Woodland Hills Golf Course in Eagle, Nebraska. All money raised will go to help send our students to Nazarene Youth Conference 2023 in Tampa, Florida. The cost will be $400 per team and includes your round of golf, your cart, flag prizes, and a goodie bag. You can find more information and the link to register your team on the Connecting Point Hub. Let's stand together again.
you glad for a faithful and capable Lord. Amen. Yes. Just as the waves, if they're still at the mention of his name, they'll say, my God is still the same. As the walls, they still fall at the mighty sound of praise. They'll say, My God is still the same. When did He break His promise? When did His kindness fail? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. When did He lose His power? When did His mercy change? I don't know if I'm supposed to say I'm back or what, but uh, it's good to see you all this morning. We missed you. I'm glad that you're here at, uh, after being gone for seven weeks. Uh, it's good to be back and see all of your smiling faces. I think, I think most people are smiling. Eh? <laughs> There's a few who haven't decided if they're happy yet, but maybe by the end of the service you'll get there. But uh, it, it really is good to be back. We missed you. And uh, I think I say this every time when I take any kind of extended leave at all, um, but it, it's true, is that, you know, it's always good to go places and experience different things, but uh, it's always great to come home, that there's no place like home, and 
Laura and I had the privilege of visiting a number of great churches throughout the country while I was gone and meeting with uh, some great ministry leaders who really built into us, and it was a great experience. But all along, I was reminded that I really love this place, and uh, this, this is a great ministry place, and we missed y'all. And um, I'm, I'm glad, though, that you were in good hands while I was gone. Uh, you definitely were. So, yeah, say thanks to the staff. I, uh, before I ever left on sabbatical, I started thinking about what my return would look like, what this Sunday would look like, and that's just, I'm kind of wired that way. I'm a planner, and um, I plan things out, and so I started thinking about that before I ever left, and um, I, I'm guilty of, there's nobody that puts more pressure on me than me. And so, for whatever reason, whenever I thought about this moment, I kind of, in my mind, had this self-imposed pressure where, like, when I came back, there would be kind of like this Moses moment, you know, (laughs) of Moses, after meeting on the mountain with God, comes down to the people and gives a thus saith the Lord moment, and um, I I had had thought about, you know, what am I going to share? In fact, um, and I don't know what you all kind of had in your mind, or if you ever even thought about it at, at all, but... Yesterday morning, I came in, and the worship team was here practicing, and I walked into the lobby, and Justin Rabel was in the back, and he was like, oh, man, I thought you'd have, like, a long beard and be eating locusts after being out in the wilderness for all that time, and I can't even grow a beard, and so, like, you know, I, I don't know, you know, so I, but, but I was thinking about, you know, maybe when I come back, I will do a little mini-series on things that I learned while I was on sabbatical, and we certainly did learn some things, and in fact, the staff and I for three hours on my first day back and began to talk about some of those things that I think will be a benefit to us as a church. And so uh, those are certainly going to come out over the coming weeks, I'm sure. But every time I started to head that direction, I felt like that God kept pulling me back in in another direction. And um, I kind of wanted to go this way, and God kept pulling me back this way. And I don't know if any of you ever argue with God. I sometimes argue with God. Probably none of you ever do that. But I really wanted to go this way, and God kept saying this way. And I've learned over the years that when I want to do this and God says this, the the wisest thing I can do is lay down what I want to do and do what God wants to do. And so that's what we're going to do this morning, uh, if that's okay. And if it's not okay, too bad, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, Because I would would rather please God than anybody else. And I just believe that he's got a great word for us this morning. He's really been working this in my heart for about four or five weeks. And uh, so I want to share it with you this morning. But before we go there, I want to back up just a second. I kind of alluded to this. But I want to just publicly say thank you, first of all, to you as a church and to our church leadership team for affording me the opportunity to take the time away that I took this summer. Um, I, I, didn't real, I, I knew that I needed it, but I didn't realize how much I needed it until I took it and didn't understand all of the reasons why I would need it. You know, I, I discovered sabbaticals kind of like life. You make your bl- best plans and then life happens and you just gotta kind of roll with it and adjust. Um, but, but we really needed that time to, to focus on some things that we weren't aware that were going to pop up, and we're thankful that we had the time. God knew, and so we're thankful for that, but thank you for that, and I want to thank, I've done this privately, but publicly, again, I want to say thank you to our pastoral staff. Um, you can clap for them as many times, we can clap for them as many times as we want, because... Uh, I, I, I didn't really learn this on sabbatical, but I was reminded of it, I think, on a much deeper level, is we are really blessed as a church with our pastoral staff. For a church our size, and we've got some great preachers. Uh, y'all, y'all were well fed while I was gone. Um, I, one of the things that I did discover is Laura and I, the whole like detaching thing, we don't do that very well. And so every week we found ourselves at some time during the week online sitting in front of the TV watching the service. And there was not a service that we watched online that we weren't ministered to. And so we have some great pastors. So thank you, Pastor um, Brian, for just your faithfulness and your, just your heart and leading us into the presence of God in worship. And you do that weekly. And Pastor Justin's back down with the kids, but he preached a couple of great sermons. And uh, Evan, 
Evan, Pastor Evan was with us and Todd. I listened to that message on the way back from Indianapolis. And man, it just blessed me. We need to figure out how to get that girl here. Uh, she, yeah, she, she preached a great message. And Pastor Jack, the old man, still got it, you know? Still got it. But uh, so th- I think that's everybody, isn't it? Like, <laughs> Pastor Brad, I didn't forget Pastor Brad. I like to give Pastor Brad a hard time because he needs it every once in a while, but did a great job. Um, I want to I wanna begin this morning uh, with just a question. I wonder, I wonder if there's anybody in this place who you need a miracle in your life. If there's anybody that's joining us online that you would just say, you know, I need for God to show up and show out. I need for God to do something miraculous in my life. Maybe it's a, a physical miracle. You need a healing in your body. You need a miracle in your body. Maybe, maybe it's financial. Maybe it's relational. Maybe emotional. Maybe uh, you need a mir- you've got somebody in your family that is a prodigal, and it's going to take a miracle to bring them home. I'm just wondering... Is there anybody here that would just say by raising their hand, that's me, I need a miracle. I need God to do a miracle. Yeah. Oh, good, good. He gave me the right message to the right people, for the right people. So God has a habit of doing that. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about miracles this morning. And I, I really believe that what God has, has tasked me to do as much as anything is to encourage you this morning. If you need a miracle in your life. And he wants me to remind you that he's still a miracle-working God. That that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and we just sang that song about, like, when has he ever failed? When has he ever not come through? And the same God who all the miracles that we read in Scripture is the same God that is our God today, the one that we can cry out to. And here's what's really cool. Scripture tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is actually in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And and so we ought to be, if there's anybody on the planet that ought to be optimistic and live with just a sense of expectation that God is going to show up and do the incredible, it ought to be us. God's a miracle-working God. And and I'm just going to preface what I have to share with you this morning is when it comes to the miracle-working power of God, I am in no means an expert. I certainly don't consider myself to be an expert in that area. In fact, I'm still an infant. Uh, There's more that I don't know and don't understand about how and why and when God works than I do understand All I know is that he's still a God who loves to display his power amongst his people. And he's still a God that we can put our hope and our trust in. And so what I want to do this morning, and and you guys know me, you know, so I've been gone for seven weeks. I got a lot to say. Um, We got a lot to cover in a short period of time, and I'm going to go as fast as I can. But I really want to do four things this morning is I want to just begin, and just as kind of a foundation, I'm going to give you kind of the ingredients that I think need to be included in every miracle. That this is, once you, you, we have these things in place, it's fertile ground for a miracle. I'm going to give you the ingredients for a miracle. I want to look at one of the great miracle stories found in Scripture, one of Jesus' greatest miracles, and we're going to kind of pull a few things from that. And then I want to talk a little bit about why sometimes there tends to be a delay. You know, sometimes God will work and do something instantaneously, but, but other times there can be a delay between our recognition of I need a miracle and the miracle actually taking place. And so why is that? And there's going to be way more reasons than the one that I'm going to focus on this morning, but I think this one is really common and exists a lot. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then, um, you know, what can we do when we're waiting during that period of time? Because there's some things that we can do and should do in between a recognition of I need a miracle and the receiving of a miracle. And then I just want to take some time to pray for, for all of us, all of us who need a miracle in our lives. So that's the plan this morning. Um, I, I want to I begin. We're going to jump right in. And I want to talk to you about the recipe for a miracle. I believe that there are really three key components. Now, I'll say this. 
that as you look at especially the miracles of Jesus, you're going to find that these three things exist all the time. There are other things oftentimes that are added in. Um, and, and I kind of think about this like, um, like if you're making a cherry pie, I mean, there may be variations in the recipe that different people use, but the bottom line is you've got to have cherries. I mean, you're not going to have cherry pie without cherries. And so these are kind of the cherries and the cherry pie. These things have to exist. They do exist as you read through Scripture. So the first one is this. Some of you may want to write this down, but the first ingredient for any miracle to take place is we have to encounter an unsolvable problem. There has to be an unsolvable problem that exists. And what I mean by that is that whatever the circumstance that we encounter in our lives, if we can fix it with our own wisdom, our own strength, our own talents, our own resources, then we don't need a miracle because we can handle it. Even if we don't have what we, like if we just need, if I just had more money, I could fix this. Which, by the way, rarely is the answer to anything. If I, if I just had more of this or more of that, then we don't need a miracle. The problem has to be unsolvable. And, and here's the thing about unsolvable problems. All of us, we, we love to witness when miracles take place. Like, for instance, how many here would love to see, I think one of the greatest miracles is the resurrection from the dead. How many here would like to see somebody raised from the dead? Amen. That'd be cool to see, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I've seen it once. It's been five years. Did I see that on Facebook the other day? Five years. My dad, many of you know this story. But I'll never forget, Laura and I were here at the church. It was a Saturday, early afternoon. Got a call from my mom and, and said, your dad, they were living in North Platte at the time, said, your dad has had a massive heart attack. It does not look good. You need to get here. And so we threw a bunch of clothes into suitcases and got in the car. It was a blur uh, driving there. We got there, and he's in the hospital, unconscious. There's tubes coming out from everywhere and machines there. And there's a machine that's helping him breathe, and there's a machine that's helping his heartbeat do what it's supposed to do. And, I mean, he's totally out of it. And the doctor said when we met with him, he said, you know, we, we had to, he was gone for 23 minutes, gone. We shocked his heart something like 17 times or something like that. And finally, we, we got it to where it was beating, but we have to have this machine on him. We have to have this machine on him. And, and, and we just want you to know that even though he's somewhat stable, we don't know, it, it, it very well could be bad news. That don't get your hopes up. That, and even if he regains consciousness, we don't know how much brain damage they're going to be. This was Saturday. And God's people started praying. You guys took that Sunday service and hijacked it and just prayed over him. And people literally around the world were praying for him. This was on Saturday afternoon. By Monday, he's sitting up, his heart's beating on its own, he's breathing on his own, no machines. We're still not, you know, the, the jury's still out on the brain damage, but <laughs> no, totally healed. Raised to life. Yeah, some people would clap for that. In fact, the truth is, he's in better health today than he was before he had the heart attack. Not on any medications, none of that stuff. He and I kind of had an argument about that in the beginning about the whole medication thing. Because, I mean, his widow maker had been 100% blocked. Miracle. Now, how many of us would not love to see that take place on a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I got another. Who wants to be the dead guy? <laughs> not as many hands. See, there's something about us that we, we love to see the supernatural take place, but none of us want to enter into the unsolvable problem. None of us want to encounter the unsolvable problem. The reality is this, that there are times in our lives that God will allow a situation to arise that is perplexing to us. There's no answer to it. We cannot fix it. And what he's doing is he's setting us up. He's adding a key ingredient to demonstrate his power. An unsolvable problem, that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is the most obvious, is that we need a power greater than ourselves. 
Again, if it's something that we can solve in our own power, we don't need a miracle. We need a supernatural power. We don't need something to take place in the natural. We need something to take place in the supernatural. We need a miracle worker. Fortunately, I know one. His name is Jesus. And he's still the same today as he was yesterday. He still has the same power. He hasn't lost any of his power. The, the third ingredient, you know, so if we look at that, many of us would say, well, what more do you need? You know, I got a situation that needs a miracle. I got somebody who can accomplish a miracle. That's probably all that I need. But if you read through scripture, there's another key element that always exists whenever a miracle takes place. And that is, there's somebody that has to bring a measure of faith to the table. There's got to be a belief that God can do what seems to be impossible. I've been stuck in the, in the book, in the fifth chapter of Mark lately, and there's a story in there about this guy named Jairus who was a, a synagogue leader, and one day he comes to Jesus, and his daughter is sick, and he says, Jesus, would you come and heal my daughter? Jesus has been healing people. Word has gotten out, so Jairus comes and says, Jesus, would you come and would you heal my daughter? Before Jesus can ever even speak, there's an interruption that takes place. There's a big crowd out around and there's this woman who has had this issue of bleeding just she, she's tried everything she's gone to every doctor she's tried every remedy and she's got this issue of ongoing bleeding and she just has this belief that if I could just grab a hold of the hem of one of Jesus's garments that that in itself would be enough to heal me and so Jesus feels this all of a sudden he goes to the he says like who touched me and the disciples that are around him there are hundreds of people pressing in and they're like, who touched you? I mean, there's a ton of people touching you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I felt power go out of me. Somebody touched me. And finally, they identify this woman. And what Jesus says to her is so key. He says, woman, your faith has healed you. While all this is taking place, some servants come of Jairus's, and they come and they say, don't bother Jesus. There's no sense in doing that. It's too late. Your daughter has died. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth are, do not be afraid, only believe. That, that word afraid, the, the original Greek word, is, it's the same word where we get the word phobia, and, and it's a word that means to elevate, to focus on, almost to the point of idolatry, to just elevate and focus on this circumstance so much that we forget who Jesus is. Jesus says, don't do that. Only believe. Here's what's interesting. So Jesus, it says, takes Matthew and, I'm sorry, takes uh, Peter, James, and John with him. And they go to the house and they get there and all the people are weeping. You know, this girl's dead and Jesus says, she's not dead, she's only asleep. And they start laughing at him. They're like, you're crazy, Jesus. I mean, we took her pulse. We checked her breath. She dead. And, and, and Jesus, this is what is so interesting to me and this jumped out to me when I read it this last time through, is that Jesus took with him into the room only Peter, James, and John and the parents. Why? He needed some people around him who were gonna have faith. I mean, Peter, James, and John, they'd been with him from the beginning. They'd seen him turn the water into wine. They'd seen him heal the sick. They'd seen him uh, cast out demons. They'd seen all this miraculous. They knew what he could do. And Jesus, even Jesus needed people around him with faith in order to do what it was he wanted to do. So you say, come on, Jesus is God. Did he really need that? Well, think about when he went to Nazareth in his own hometown. And it says that he didn't do very many miracles there. And it tells us the reason why was because of their lack of faith. Somebody's got to have faith. I'm telling you this morning that if you're somebody that needs a miracle in your life, one of the best things that you can do is surround yourself with people who have faith. 
People who are going to stand beside you and pray with you and agree with you and are going to say, you know what, I'm going to take the faith that I have and I'm going to add it to yours. And I'm going to, the Bible says that our tongues hold the power of life and death. And so we need people around us who are going to speak life into us and who aren't going to be a discouragement to us. Discourage, take courage away. We need people who are going to encourage, impart courage into us that are gonna increase our belief, increase our faith. So we need to remember that, man. I'm telling you what, if you've got a situation in your life that appears to be unsolvable and, and, and you just don't, you don't know the answer to it, you can't figure it out, and, and you believe because you know there is a power greater than yourself, man, you've got the prime ingredients for a miracle to take place. This is what happened in the story I want to talk to you about this morning. This, it's interesting. This particular miracle is the only miracle of Jesus outside the resurrection of Jesus that is recorded in all of the Gospels. Matthew writes about it. Mark writes about it. Luke writes about it. John writes about it. We know it as the feeding of the 5,000. I'm going to look at, at John's Gospel primarily. It's found in John chapter 6. And, and really, it says the feeding of the 5,000s, but scholars tell us that it really ought to be more like the feeding of the 20,000. Because in those days, only men or heads of households were counted whenever ever people gathered together. And so Matthew tells us that there's 5,000, but they're not counting women and children. So scholars say it could be as many as 20,000 that are there. But I just want to read this story to you. It's found in, in uh, John chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version this morning, and I'm going to start reading with verse 1. And we'll put it up on the screen as well. But it says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already knew it, or he already had in mind what he was going to do. Well, Philip answered him. He said, it would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many. Jesus said, have the people sit down, for there was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down, about 5,000 men were there, and Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and they filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had been eaten. What an incredible miracle! What an incredible miracle! I want to kind of hone in on a minute on the key verse, which I think is verse 6. It says, he asked this only to test them. He asked this only to test them. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is a test. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I mean, maybe I wasn't clear on that. <clears throat> like out loud. And you actually got to turn to somebody. And then you say it like out loud, this is a test. Okay. I'll never make you do that again, I promise. We hate it when we have to do that. But I, I remember, some of you guys remember this when you were kids. I remember when I was a kid, we had three stations for, on television. 
And every once in a while, you'd be watching one of the, one of them was PBS, so like nobody, well, maybe there was four, I guess. I don't know. There wasn't very many, but you, you'd be watching your program, and in the middle of it, there would be this rude interruption. There'd be an obnoxious noise, and then you would hear a voice that would say, this is only a test of the emergency broadcasting system. If this were an actual emergency, then instructions would follow. You guys remember that? They, they did this. We became trained because of that message that we became trained to tune in and watch for whatever came next. That in the case of emergency, there would be instructions that were given that would help us be able to make it through whatever it was we were going to face in that moment. This is the same language that Jesus is using here in this test, in this text. He is, he is testing his disciples here in order to accomplish something. He's using these circumstances, this unsolvable situation in order to test his disciples. Some of you say, well, does Jesus really do that? Does he test us? Absolutely he does, and absolutely he will. Scripture says he'll never tempt us, but you can be rest assured he will at times test us. And I, 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 we'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit about why, but I'll just say this. I believe that Jesus is doing something here in order to test his disciples, in order to prepare his disciples for the greater things that he had in store for them. That they were going to need a greater measure of faith in order to accomplish and walk into what he had prepared for them. In John chapter 14, Jesus tells them this. He says, you will do all of the things that you've seen me do. And then he goes on and he makes this statement that just blows my mind. Laura and I were talking about this the other night. But he says, and you shall do greater things. See, Jesus, in his three years of ministry on this planet, gathered the 12 around him, and his, his, his goal for them was to prepare them for the greater things. Whenever you're being tested in life, it's not to tear you down. It, it, it's not because Jesus is upset with you. It's because he's preparing you for something greater. That's good news. I'm preaching way better than you guys are responding right now. <laughs> He, he's preparing us for greater things. He will test us. And, and so it was a test. Someone once said this. They said, a faith that has not been tested is a faith that can't be trusted. A faith that's never been tested is a faith that, that can't be trusted. And so understand this. There are times where God will test us, and the reason that he'll test us is he wants for us to have a faith that we can trust in, a faith that we can hold on to, a faith that when the storms of life come and when impossible situations come, we're not going to be shaken because we're holding on to the one that we know can solve the unsolvable problems. And he's testing us. Well, I want to look at this story a little bit and, and kind of work our way through it. I'll just give you a little bit of context. I'm preaching like Brad. I had to take a drink there. <laughs> just a little bit of context. So Jesus, the, a lot of scholars put this event in the last year of Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus has had some time. He's been going around the countryside and he's been performing miracles. He's, he's healed the sick. He's made lame legs uh, walk again, made them whole. He's healed lepers. He's cast out demons. And so everywhere that Jesus goes, word spreads ahead that Jesus is coming. There's the, the thinking that maybe this guy really is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. And so wherever he goes, crowds gather. Well, Jesus takes the disciples and they go out into the countryside, away from the towns, away from the people. But the people find out that Jesus is in the area. So all of a sudden, this, this large crowd begins to gather around Jesus and Jesus sees the crowd. In Matthew's gospel, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Man, can I tell you this morning, Jesus is still a God of compassion. 
That when he looks at us, he has compassion upon. When he sees the situations that break our hearts and the situations that cause us pain, he's not hard. He's not, he has compassion. He looks with eyes of compassion. And he sees these people, and his heart is filled with compassion. And he turns to Philip, and he says, you know, Philip, where are we going to buy enough groceries to feed all of these people? And I'm sure, Philip, I tried to put myself in his position, and I'm sure Philip is like, there's 11 other guys here. Why are you picking on me, Jesus? Well, well, scholars tell us there's a couple of reasons. One is that Philip was from that area. His hometown was Bethsaida, which is the closest town to the area where this miracle took place. And so in my mind, I just kind of imagine as Jesus and the disciples are traveling and they're coming into that area, Philip, just in the natural course of conversation, he's talking with his buddies and he's like, I mean, this is his home. He's like, man, over here, you see, that's where I grew up over there. And there's where I went to high school over there. And this is the pond where me and, me and my buddies, we used to go skinny dipping over here. And, you know, this is where you can get the best fish. I mean, they got the best fish and chips and they got the best ice cream and stay away from this place over here because my cousin Wally worked there and one time he spit in the food and the health department came in. And so, I mean, Philip knows the area and he knows where it would be possible to get food. So Jesus asked Philip. The second reason is Philip had been with Jesus from the beginning. So Philip had been with Jesus for the very first miracle. Philip was there when at the wedding they ran out of wine. And Philip saw how that Jesus didn't send the disciples out to just, you know, go buy a bunch of cheap wine and bring it back and give it to the people. He witnessed Jesus take bathtub water and turn it in to the best wine that they had ever tasted. He, 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 had, he had witnessed that. And so he, he looks at, at, at Philip and he says, where are we going to get enough groceries? And Philip is like, Jesus... This is impossible. I mean, even if we had eight months wages and everybody just got a bite, and, and like, even if you sent me to Hy-Vee and you sent uh, Peter to Russ's Market and, and you sent James to Sam's Club, we still couldn't get enough food for these people. Philip hadn't got it yet, quite yet. He said, this is an impossible situation. The very next verse, now I'd read this story a lot of times. I had never picked up on this before. But the very next verse says that Jesus didn't ask him about bread because he actually intended for him to go buy bread or to go shopping because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Guys, This is just Jesus being sneaky. I mean, I suspected this for a while, but Jesus, I think, was sneaky. I mean, if you don't read through the Gospels and see Jesus with a glimmer in his eye and a chuckle under his breath, I don't think you're seeing the right Jesus. One of the things I love about that series, The Chosen, that has come out is I love how it emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. It's like Jesus was somebody that you'd like to be around. I mean, people just wanted to be around him. And, and Jesus in this point, he's just being sneaky here. He's testing Philip. It's a test. And again, Philip's been with Jesus from the beginning. He's seen the miracles. And so Jesus tests Philip and he's like, Philip, what, what, what should we do? What do you think that maybe we ought to do in this situation where there's not enough food and we've got all these people? I wonder, what, do you have any ideas? I mean, what could I, as the son of God, maybe do in this situation? <laughs> it was a test. And Philip missed it. He's like, Jesus, You're asking me this, and there's not even a Costco anywhere. What am I going to do? He freaks out. Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus says, okay, so what do you have? And all of a sudden, Andrew steps up. Andrew's been silent to this point, but Andrew steps up. 
And, and he says, um, you know, we've got this little boy who's got five barley loaves and two small fish. And, and I love one of the things, if you read through, Andrew doesn't get a lot of, like, mention in the Bible. But if you read through, especially the Gospel of John, most of the time when Andrew shows up, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. He brings his brother to Jesus. He brings like some rando Greeks to Jesus at one point in time, and now he's bringing this little kid to Jesus. I'm just wondering, what if we just lived life like Andrew and just brought people to Jesus? I mean, what if we just lived our life and like said, man, you got to meet this guy that just made the, the biggest difference in my life. And I, I want to come to church. With, I want you to come to church with me sometime and just experience something that's really important to me. Just come and check. Come and see. Come and check it out. Man, I want to talk to you for just a minute about the greatest decision that I ever made in my life. What if we were just like Andrew and we just invited people, we brought people to Jesus? And so Andrew says, you know, we've got these, we've got a couple little fish here. Jesus, I, I, I wrote this down. Jesus will never ask us for more than he's already given to us. He'll never ask you for more than he's given to you. He just says, what do you have? What is it that you have? And as his followers, he he, he does expect out of us, this is part of following Jesus, he does expect us to give back to him what he's given to us. When I was on sabbatical, I met with um, one of the, I met with Pastor Joel Atwell, who's the lead pastor of the church that I served at before I came here. And uh, they're in the midst, the beginning stages of a, uh, they've been needing to build for years. Their, um, their worship space is like a sanctanasium, so it's a gym and it's multi-use space. And they don't have any children's space and they don't have really dedicated use space. And so they've been needing to do this for years. And, and uh, so finally they, they hired an architect, the place where they're going to do this big building project and add to their building and I asked him, I said, you know, with your plan, how much is, do you think this is, this is going to cost? And uh, he said, you know, somewhere like around $12 million. Big price tag, isn't it? I, that's what I did. was like, ooh. And uh, he said, but the cool thing is, he said, we've got a couple of guys in our church that uh, God has really blessed them, and, and um, they each have committed a million dollars apiece. <clears throat> and I'm just, you know, being, I didn't say that to him, but this is what was going on in my mind, and I know none of you probably ever do stuff like this, but in my mind I was like, I wish we had a couple millionaires in our church. <laughs> you know, I wish we had somebody who could give a million dollars in our church. I, there's a lot of things that I'd like to do that a couple million dollars would put us really close to doing that. I wish we had a couple... And in the midst of that, God spoke to me, and really clear. And he said, Doug, I have already placed in your hands everything you need to do everything that I've called you to do. As a church, I've already placed in your hands everything you need to do what I've called you to do. Folks, we have what we need. They have, yeah, and it's great. They have two guys that are going to give a million dollars apiece. The other $10 million are coming from people like you and me. God has given us everything that we need. But the deal is that way too often, out of fear, we tend to want to hang on to whatever it is that he's given to us, what we have, are, are not enough. I, I mean, this, what, for, for, in this situation, Andrew brings this little boy to Jesus with two barley loaves, and, or I mean, uh, five barley loaves, small barley loaves, and five small, or two small fish. I forgot how to count while I was gone, but <laughs> some barley loaves and some fish. Barley was the food of the poor. 
In, in those days, you could tell a person's wealth by what kind of bread they ate. And barley was like the lowest of the low. And, and so here's Andrew... And he's bringing to Jesus, he's saying, Jesus says, what do you have? Whatever it is that you have, bring it to me. And he says, well, we've got this, uh, these five barley loaves and two small fish. And then he follows it up with the statement, but what is that among so many? Let me tell you what it is. It's enough in the hands of Jesus to feed 20,000 people. See, see, our problem is we need to take what we have and we need to put it in the hands of Jesus. And, and way too often, yeah, we, we can clap for that. Way too often out of fear, we tend to hang on to what we have and we're like, you know, what, what about me? And what about, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta look out for me and I gotta make sure that I have enough for me and I've got, you know, I've got my future to think of and I've got retirement to think of and I'm not sure that I'm gonna have enough to take care of myself and I'm, I'm, I'm just not in the right position to give now. But when I get more, then maybe I'll give. And Jesus reminds us here, he says, no, 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 no. What do you have now? Bring me what you have now. So Andrew comes to Jesus with these barley loaves and bread. And Jesus does this incredible miracle with the It's not enough. Some of you might want to write this down. A seed never looks like the harvest it contains. When a seed is planted, it never looks like the harvest that it will produce. A couple months ago, uh, Dad and I were talking. My dad likes to garden and I did not inherit that, but he, he loves to garden and grow stuff. I'm good at killing it. He's good at growing it. But um, he, he and, and tomatoes, I think, are, he's always talking about tomatoes. So I think that's his favorite plant to grow. But we were talking about that, and he'd done all this study on the tomatoes and all this kind of stuff. And, and he, he was telling me that each tomato plant that is planted, each seed that is planted that produces a, a tomato plant can produce anywhere from 30 to 40 pounds of tomatoes. And I Googled it because I didn't trust him. No, I <laughs> wanted to make sure. And Google agreed with my dad and said, yeah, that's true. And depending on the size of the tomatoes, that, that means that each seed could produce anywhere from 30 to 90 tomatoes. And so I asked him, I said, you got any Tomato seeds, I don't even know if, what a tomato seed looks like. So he brought me this envelope, and there's like 10 or 12 of them in here. And um, I have one here in my hand, and uh, everybody see that? <laughs> I don't know if the camera can see that. Bryson, come here. Come here, come here, come here. Just to make sure. So a lot of you think he's just doing this, and there's nothing. There's a seed there, right? Yep. Yeah. He verifies there's a seed. Can you? And he's, yeah, you can have it. Yeah, thank you. I just, I just wanted verification that I wasn't lying. So that little tiny seed, I got more. If anybody wants a seed, I got more. But this, this little tiny seed here produces somewhere between, you know, 30, 90. Okay, you all don't look that impressed yet. <laughs> Brian, could you help me here? I brought, I brought a visual for you, so come over here. I forgot to tell you it's heavy, so I set that on there, so. Now you're impressed, all right. This, this is a visual congregation. So this little tiny Seed, when it's sown, has the potential to produce this. Wow. Here's the deal. 
If you're not willing to sow this, if you're not willing to give us this, give up this, Scripture says that unless a seed is planted in the ground and dies, then it's not going to produce any fruit. If you're not willing to sow this, you'll never see that. There are some here this morning, some who are watching online. And you're like, man, I need a miracle. In my, I need a financial miracle in my life. But you're not sowing anything. See, the thing is, we've got to give Jesus something to work with. We, we've got to take an out of trust and faith and belief put in his hands and operate out of obedience and give back to him what is due him in order for him to do the miracle that he wants to do in our lives. This is another one of those things. Don't ask me to explain it because I can't. But God has his own economy that makes absolutely no sense that when we take our little and put it in his hands, he can produce more out of it than if we just try and keep it all and do it ourselves. I don't understand how that works or why it works the way that it does. I just know that it does. We've got to give God something to work with. So Andrew comes to Jesus with just a seed, five small loaves, two small fish, and out of that comes this great miracle, which leads us to verse 11. Before the miracle takes place, Jesus stops for a moment and he gives thanks for what he's holding in his hands. I don't want you to miss this. Jesus gives thanks for the not enough. Jesus gives thanks for they don't have enough money. Philip's already said that. He admitted we don't have enough money. But Jesus stops and he says, I'm going to give thanks for what I have. Listen, can we give thanks for our not enough? Can, can, we, can we give thanks for the fact that we don't have enough financial resources to accomplish whatever it is that we need to accomplish in that moment. Can, can we give thanks for in the midst of the impossible situation, can we give thanks? God, I don't have enough wisdom that it's going to take in order to get me through this, but I want to thank you for the wisdom that you've given to me. I've got enough at least to run to you. Can we give thanks? God, I don't have enough strength to get through this, but I want to thank you for the strength that you've given me because I'm still standing. And so thank you for that. Can we give thanks? God, I can't figure this whole thing out and I don't see how this is going to play out. In fact, if I'm honest, I cannot with my physical eyes even see a positive route through this situation, but I want to give you thanks anyway. In this moment, can we thank him anyway? Can we hold not enough in our hands and be thankful in the midst of it? I think this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says that it is God's will for all of us to be thankful in everything. Not for everything, but in everything. You see, there's something that happens. Things begin to change in our hearts and things begin to change in our world when we develop a grateful spirit standing in the midst of a big impossible problem and we're giving thanks anyway. There's something that happens in that moment. In Luke's gospel, it says that he not only gave thanks, it says this, it says he blessed it and he broke it. I, I, I just think I might be talking to some people today who have some broken places in their lives. And if that's you, I want you to know this morning that whatever Jesus allows to be broken, he will always bless. 
If he's allowed it, he'll bless it. Around here, we use language like this. We say, God never wastes a hurt. We can, but God never will. You see, whatever it is that is broken in our lives, and whatever God allows to be broken, he will always bless it. If you need proof of that, go back to, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus begins by saying things like this, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. You see, God always blesses the brokenness. Brokenness, if it's anything, it's a setup for God to bless us. And here's the deal, if you don't allow yourself in your brokenness to to get mad at Jesus, because the reality is we have two choices and two choices alone, is either we can get angry at Jesus and we can run away from him, or we can just press into him and we can trust him. And each one is a choice. And here's the deal, if we don't allow ourselves in our brokenness to get mad at Jesus and run from Jesus, but instead we run to him, then he will take the very things in your life that are the most broken and he will use those very things in a greater level, on a greater level, than any of the positive things that you see in your life. He will use your brokenness more than he'll use your talent. He will use your brokenness more than he'll use your abilities. In fact, the very things that oftentimes we think disqualify us in regards of God God, are the things that he tends to work through the most. Man, that's the way that God works. God never wastes a hurt. I want you to, again, look at verse 11. This is important. We're almost done here, but I think it's interesting. Jesus does this miracle The bread is distributed. The fish is distributed. And I want you to notice how much they got. See, see, uh, Philip is talking about, you know, we, we could do this, and if everybody just got a little bite, we still wouldn't have enough money to do this. Jesus does this miracle, and it says that they got as much as they wanted. In other words... They received as much as they chose to receive. They got as much as they wanted. Listen, there's a spiritual principle here that I don't want us to miss, that God's word, it will feed you as much or as little as you want it to feed you. What we receive in our time in prayer, we will receive in direct proportion to as much or as little as we choose to connect with God in prayer. This is a spirit, God will never force on us anything. He, this, he has it wide open for us. You can have as much as you want, but here's the deal. There are 52 weeks in the year and you can come to church as often or as little as you choose to come. You see, what I'm trying to help you understand is that there's a spiritual principle that, that relates to how much Will you get fed as much or as little as you choose to eat? How much will you connect with God? How much are you willing to pray? How much are you willing to spend time engaged in worship? How much will you get blessed? How much are you willing to tithe and give away and and, and operate under that spiritual principle? How much will you get encouraged? Well, how much are you going to be willing to uh, give yourself over to connecting and spending time with the people of God? They ate as much or as little as they wanted. Wow. Folks, This is the truth. We can have as much or as little as we want. We can see God move in our lives as much or as little as we want. 
This is the awesome part of this is that God or Jesus took this not enough. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave thanks for it. They ate as much or as little as they want. And then they gathered up more than they had when they started. God will always, he's the God of exceedingly, abundantly more than we can even think of or imagine. That's who he is. He's still a miracle working God. So real quick, I'm going to ask the band to come. And Sometimes, and I don't understand why, there are times when all of the ingredients are in place. There's, there's the unsolvable problem. There's belief. There's a miracle working God that's in place. And there are times where sometimes there's a delay. There's this testing time. James talks about in James chapter 1 that we can consider it all joy whenever we go through trials of many kind because there's a purpose behind it. It's that testing that produces uh, endurance, which in the end brings perfection or maturity into our lives. It's this idea, again, of preparation for greater things, that God wants to do greater things. So that certainly is one of the big whys behind why is it sometimes that there's a delay. But what I really want to just leave you with this morning is what, what do we do in that time between the need of the miracle and the miracle taking place when we're waiting? I'll just be honest with you. There are some miracles that Laura and I have been praying for and waiting for for over 15 years. We, if, if, if things are going to change in this particular area of our lives, it's going to take a miracle of God for it to happen. There's a couple things that we're just praying for and waiting for. They haven't happened yet. What do you do in that period of time? I want to I give you just three things here. Number one, is remember what we've been talking about in those moments when you begin to question. Remember, this is only a test. God, God is doing something in me in this season that he's delaying this, this moment, this time. He's delaying it because he wants to strengthen my faith. He wants to give me something that I can hold on to. He wants to pull me deeper into his heart. Remember, it's only a test. The, the disciples, again, they were training for something greater. It's really interesting because this wasn't the only test that the disciples encountered. If you read earlier in John's gospel, there was a time where they were out on the Sea of Galilee and a storm comes up. Jesus is asleep in the front of the boat and they think they're going to die. They're like, well, the storm, we're not going to make it. And Jesus is sleeping. Jesus wakes up and says, peace, be still. And this thing that they thought was going to kill him goes away. He does this miracle, the Sermon on the Mount. Immediately after this, they take their 12 baskets. How many disciples are there? 12. One for each of them. As a reminder of the miracle working power of God. And Jesus says, I want you to get in a boat. I want you to go to the other side and I'll meet you over there. I'm going to go up on the mountain to pray. So they get in the boat. They're in the boat and they got their basket full of bread and they're talking about, man, that was incredible, wasn't it? Wasn't that awesome? When, and, and I'm sure Peter, he's got a big, he was like, yeah, I knew that Jesus was going to do something. I do it. You guys didn't know, but I kind of knew. And I was just quiet because I didn't want to say anything and embarrass you all, but I knew he was going to do something pretty awesome. He's sitting there with the bread and all of a sudden the wind starts to blow they're three miles out. Across the Sea of Galilee is six miles. So they're in the middle. I mean, it, it can't go back, can't go forward. The wind is blowing and the waves are rising and the sea is rocking and they're in this little boat. Jesus is up on a mountainside this time watching them. <laughs> and they did what we do. Whenever we face storms, they forgot what they were holding right in front of them, what Jesus had just done. They had forgotten the miracle. He's already done this miracle once, and they forgot about it. And it says that Jesus was up on the mountainside, and now he's watching them. And he comes down, and he walks on the water, and again, calms the storm. Hey, can I tell you this morning, 
that we serve a God who walks on the things that scare us to death. He walks on them. And what Jesus was doing here, I thought about this. I thought, you know, so what Jesus was doing was he was trying to get their faith to a place where they trusted him when he was right there physically with him in the boat. He wanted them to be at a place where they could trust him when he was on the mountain watching them. But where he really wanted to get them was there was going to come a time when he was going to be hung on a cross. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be buried. He was going to rise again. And he was going to ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father. And he wanted to get them to a place where their faith was so strong that then they would go out into all of the world with an unshakable faith that would revolutionize the planet. See, that's what he was after. That's what he was doing. And I just wonder, while you're waiting, maybe God is doing something like that in your heart and my heart. Maybe he wants to produce something that is greater than you can imagine. Remember, it's only a test. Number two, I think it's important that we worship while we wait. We worship while we wait. We we have this tendency when it comes to worship is to forget what it's all about. That really at its core, worship is assigning worth, the worth that's due to the God who is the object of our worship. And instead of doing that, regardless of what our circumstances is, you know, we tend to operate in such a way as I, you know, I kind of like this song, so I'll worship to this one, but I don't like that one, so I'm not gonna engage in that. Or, you know, this was just a cruddy week and I don't really feel like worshiping and so But this week was a great week. I mean, everything went my way, and so yeah, I'm gonna worship and I'm gonna. And what we do is we make worship about us. We, we make it in that moment about our circumstances. And we're not even, ultimately, we're not even worshiping God. We're worshiping whatever is taking place in our life in the moment or whatever it is that we like. Listen, God is worthy of our worship for one reason and one reason alone. And it's because he's God. He's God. And he's worthy. Some of you may have seen this. This last week, within the last two weeks, Bill Johnson, who's the pastor of Bethel Church out in Redding, California, which is where a bunch of the songs that we sing on Sunday morning come from, but his wife, Benny, passed away after a long fight with cancer. And uh, Laura and I, last week, we sat and we watched her memorial service, and uh, he spoke at the service. I have no idea how he was able to do that. And then... I think she died, or the service was like on a Wednesday or Thursday or something like that, and then he spoke the following Sunday, and we watched that too. And he made this statement. He said, you know, we don't have the option of choosing whether we'll experience pain and loss in this lifetime. That it's just a part of a fall, living in a fallen world. It's a, it's a part of... Of, of sin and we're all going to go through it. We don't have the option of choosing. What we do have the option of doing is when pain comes into our lives, will we use that as an excuse to push God away or will we use it as a propellant to drive us further into his heart? And he said, the interesting thing is he said, I just want you to know that I have chosen in the midst of all of this not just to go deeper into the heart of God, but I have chosen to worship him in these moments. He said, don't get me wrong, I'm hurting, I'm devastated. But I've discovered that when, when when I get to heaven, there will be no more pain. There's not gonna be any tears there's not going to be any heartache. And he said, I'm going to stand before the, the, the throne and out of the joy that wells up in my heart, I'm going to sing, holy, 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 holy is the Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He said, and in that moment, it will be the fullness of joy. But he said, what I've discovered in my loss is that I have an opportunity now in this life that I will never, ever have on the other side of heaven. 
that I have the opportunity to worship him in my pain. I have the opportunity to praise him in my loss. And, and folks, this may be what people talk about when they talk about the sacrifice of praise. I don't think most of us understand really what that is to really sacrifice in our praise and our worship. And in those moments when there's a delay, we have the opportunity to just worship, to praise him for who he is. Praise him not because he's not our magic genie doing what we want him to do in this moment under our control, but because he's God who loves us. And there will come a day where we'll understand it all. And, and we'll be able to say, when we understand, we'll be able to say, and God, you have done all things well. And so we need to worship. The, the last one I'm gonna leave you with is this, is while we're waiting, we need to remember that God has a perfect track record. That he's never failed, never lost a battle, never made a mistake, never forgotten about anybody, never misjudged. He, he's never failed. He's always come through. And, and not everybody understood it in the moment all the time. <laughs> Maybe that's why we sing that song, by and by, when the morning comes, we'll understand. <laughs> but he's got a perfect track record. And I just wanna remind you this morning, I wanna encourage you, this is the God who loves you. This is the God who is for you. And what I wanna do, we're gonna wrap things up and, you know, big surprise, I went over on my time limit, so, oh well. I want to invite you to stand. And if you're here this morning and you're in that place where you say, you know what, this was for me today. I, I, I'm facing an unsolvable problem. If God doesn't come through, I need a miracle. I need him to touch me today. Then what I want you to do, I want to pray for you. And I'm not going to call anybody out or anything like that. I just want to pray over us this morning. And I'm going to ask you, that if that's you this morning, just in a posture of receiving to take and just kind of put your hands out, palms up. And I just want to pray this prayer over us this morning. Father, what we recognize that we need more than anything else in this moment today, Holy Spirit, is what we need is we need you to breathe upon us. We need you to intersect our impossible situation, Lord. We need you to touch us. We need you to do what we cannot do for ourselves. We believe that you are a miracle-working God. And so this morning, Father, as there are many of us who are standing here in this place and probably many more who are worshiping online are saying, include me in this. I'm, I'm there. I need a touch from you, Lord. Father, today we cry out to you because we know that you are a miracle worker. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move amongst this place where there are bodies that need to be healed. We pray that you as the healer, the great physician would move and you would touch broken bodies. We pray over those who are suffering with cancer today and we know that we have those among us. Father, I pray for a special healing touch today. I pray for, for tumors to be shrunk and disappear. I pray, Father, for you to do what only you can do. Cancer doesn't scare you at all. There are some who have been fighting it for years and this morning, Lord, I pray for just the, the breath of your spirit to rest upon them today. Father, there are others who are in need of other physical touches today and I pray again that you would just breathe on them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, there are some here this morning and Lord, they need a financial healing and Lord, we believe that you, your, your resources are not limited. And Father, if the challenge today is to sow seeds, help us to sow, help us to sow, help us to sow, trusting that you and your economy will do far more than we could do on our own. There are those who need healings in relationships, Lord. There are some here this morning, and if the truth were to be known, it looks like their marriage is dead. 
And God, we believe that you're a healer of all things. You're a restorer of all things. And I pray that in this moment you would sweep in and you would begin to do a healing work. Lord, we pray over prodigals that have have run from you and there are parents in this room who their hearts are broken because of the state of their children. And today, Lord, we cry out to you, bring them home, Lord. Put people around them who love you and would minister uh, to them on your behalf and would speak truth into their lives and would show them and demonstrate your love. Awaken them, Lord, to the truth of who you are and how much you love them, the healing that is available. Lord, just sweep through this place today and do what only you can do. Lord, I believe that there are some you're touching right here in this moment. And Father, for those of us who maybe we're, we walk out from this place and we're still in that place of waiting, I pray that you'd help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you, that we would continue to run into your arms and not away from you, and that we would trust you. And we're gonna pray this. And as a sign of belief, we're all together gonna say this together, amen, in Jesus' name, ready? And all God's people said, amen, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stay standing and sing this together also. As a declaration of this truth, God is still the same today, amen. I'm calling on the God of Jesus. Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I need
together. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, yes. Almighty River, come and fill me again. Come and fill, yes, again. One more. Come and fill me again. Amen. Yeah. God bless you. We will see you next week.